the rats by james herbert chapter one henry gilfoyle was slowly drinking himself to death he started six years ago age of forty been a successful salesman for midland paper company and was ready to become area manager the trouble was falling in love late in life unfortunately falling for one of his junior salesmen he trained young francis for five weeks taking him on his business journeys up and down the country. At first, he wasn't sure if the boy had the same inclinations as himself, but as he grew to know him, the shyness, quiet loneliness of his prodigy seemed slowly dissolved, that incredible gap he always felt with other men. Why Francis had decided to become a salesman, he never discovered. He wasn't the type, Gilfoyle, Ed could hold his own in the company of any group of men. He could be the typical buff salesman, a dirty jerks and sly wink, black sapping, professionalism of his trade hiding, any imperfections, his maleness. He was a good actor. Francis was different. Seeing the shadow of his homosexuality dampened his natural spirits, guilt treating guilt treating his moods. He wanted to prove himself to be accepted, and he chosen a career that would make him forget his own personality reflecting that of others. The third week he stayed in a small hotel in Bradford. Eight double rooms were available, so he shared one with single beds. He had been drinking most of the afternoon with a client. The lunch taking him to the usual local strip club, Guilfoyle had watched Francis in a darkened basement, called a club, because it had a bar and a membership fee. The boy had watched the girls all night, but not with the exaggerated look of lust shown on the face of their client and himself, on himself, of course. And when the final sequin garment of the girl had been thrown aside, he slapped the boy's thigh on the table with a skillful hotness, letting his finger linger just for a moment, but long enough for their eyes to meet, and then he knew, oh, that glorious moment when he really knew. There had been signs after the first week, of course. Your testicle foil had set, nothing daring, nothing that could even cause even slight embarrassment. He rebuffed. He'd even be, if he'd been right, he knew he'd seen the boy in the smile of boy's eyes. No surprise, not even apprehension, and certainly not alarm. The rest of the afternoon passed on, passed with a dreamlike quality. His heart beat wildly every time he looked at the boy, but still he acted superbly. His vulgar and ugly, must he ugly, client never suspected. There are men in a wind's well, leering at big breasted, deformed women. Boy was a bit green, of course, but they showed him how, how a real man acted when they were confronted by naked thighs and t- fleshy tits. Quilfoyle emptied his glass of scotch, threw back his head, and laughed. When they got to the hotel, the hotel Goyfield had chosen for special reasons, the boy was sick, he wasn't used to drink. The Goyfield piled him with whiskey all afternoon. Now he began to have regrets. Perhaps he'd overdone it. Both had been sick of the cab on the way back to the club. Then again in the room in the sink. Goyfield ordered black coffee and poured three cups in the half-conscious boy. There was a mess on the boy's coat, shirt, to go, so Goyfield Tony took them off and scrubbed the worst bits, but worst parts in the hot water. And Francis began to cry. He was sitting in his bed, head in his hands, his pale shoulders shuddering convulsively. A lock of fair hair fell upon his long, thin fingers. Gorfell sat next to him, put his arm round over the boy's shoulder. The boy's head leaned into Gorfell's chest. Then he was cradling him in his arms. They stayed like that for a long time, the older boy, man, Rocking the younger one back and forth like a five year old to the sobbing faded on occasional whimper. Grover slowly undressed Francis and put him into bed. He gazed at him for a while and undressed himself. Got him beside the boy and closed his eyes. Grover would never forget that night. He made love as the boy had surprised him. He wasn't innocent. He had seen never as Grover had fallen in love. He knew the dangers. He heard the stories made away of men, young boys, knew their invulnerability. He was happy for the first time after making love to another man. He felt clean, purged, 
was a feeling of guilt. Gone was a feeling of self-contempt. Disgust, he felt free. Alive, more alive than he ever been. I gone back to the company after collecting a fair size order for the client Bradford, and all had gone well for a while. Both expected to be area manager. A few weeks, large orders were coming in. Saw Francis every day in most evenings. As fully at first, things began to change. The young lads seemed to be losing their respect. The younger lads seemed to be losing their respect for him. Nothing much, just a cheeky back answers to him. His older colleagues didn't seem have much to say to him any more. He didn't avoid him exactly, but when in his company, the conversation was always slightly strained. Put it down the fact he seemed to be manager. He didn't know quite how to treat him. But then he caught some of the typists smirking behind his back at each other. Oh, Miss Robertson, the officer spinster, wouldn't even talk to speak to him. Finally, that fateful day, it was after lunch, a turn from the local off, off his pub. A table was always reserved for him. When he was in town and gone, in the staff toilet. He went to the cubicle, took his tread down, sat down, sat, sat and began to think about the new business venture he had in mind once he was area manager. Then he glanced at the back of the door. He froze. It was covered with graffiti, all about him. Evidently, after the first one, it developed in a game for marks. It was awarded to each one. Called draw- drawings, all of him. He said that Francis made a mistake to make. Fancy? Francis, because of his long hair, fell across his forehead. Gaunt features, cotton drawings, making his love ridiculous, ugly gorms. Blood rushed his head, tears filled his eyes. How could they? How could they destroy their precious love like this? Dirty little minds coming in here, scratching on the floor, door, sniggering. He sat there for half an hour, quietly weeping. He finally realised how ridiculous, how pathetic he looked. A middle-aged man in love with a young boy, sitting in a toilet with trousers around round his ankles. Crying over words and drawings, and understood enough. And understood nothing of his life. He went home. He could face, couldn't face returning to the office and smirks of so-called friends. He drank a bottle of scotch. That was the beginning of his deterioration. He went back to work the next day, but now it was different. He was aware. He saw joy in every remark made. He went home again. That lunchtime, buying a fresh bottle of scotch in the way. After two weeks, began to get a grip of himself, but suddenly Francis left. He hadn't said goodbye, but left a brief note saying he's sorry, but he couldn't stand persecution from people he worked with any longer. He went to the boy's home, but a hysterical scene with Francis' mother made him realise it was finished. A threat was involved in law, convinced him of his of this. Francis was very young. He tell him he'll plunge as rapid after this. He lost his chance of promotion. Never quite sure if it was because of his reputation. The fact he rarely is sober now, probably both. He designed to move back down to London. He designed to move down to London to lose himself in a cold bar, countless other delusional, delusional people. So for six years he hadn't worked much, had drunk steadily till his money ran out, thrown out of lodgings more times than he could remember. He dodged jobs down then in markets, but mainly spit. Bits, bits, bits of fields, pleasure marrows, lonely lorries. The few pence he made from his this, he bought cheap tobacco. Felt rough at one time, being able to fulfil his sexual needs in a dusty old cinema, sitting next to men of his own kind. Made twice had he been threatened. Once very quietly with menace, the other time with more shouting and fist waving, as his eyes and smile were centred on his shame. But now he is too unkept for even that. His clothes reeked. His body smelt of grime, picked up in the market in shreds where he slept. Any time left in his body had been burnt out by the cheaply conducted alcohol he now drunk. All he cared for now was saving his meagre earnings to buy more oblivion. Gilfoyle had worked hard that week. He conquered his craving for drinks so that he could buy a complete bottle of cheap gin that Saturday. How he survived, he never knew, but somehow he managed. Men a picture full of g- bottled gin, ever present in his mind. Now, as he shuffled along the dark streets by the docks, he drank to his head, spun and his steps come more unsteady. He climbed through a crumbling window of a house the slum clearance people hadn't yet cleared. Staring in the rubble, he made his way to the back of the 
house to be out of the way then he liked shone in by a policeman nothing better to do he sat down the corner of what must have been once been the kitchen before the bottle was completely empty fell into drunken stupor hours later Gilfoyle woke with a start he defogged his mind and registered something he didn't know what he drained the rest of the gym before he felt the sharp pain in the left hand he jerked the hand up to his mouth he heard something scurry away he drew the bottle after the the sound when he was tasted blood at the back of his hand again the frog and taste of his own sickly blood made him wrench he rolled inside as the gym began to pump free from his body lately until his body shook so then he felt the pain again his outraged stretched left hand he shrieked when he realized something was gnawing at the tendons he tried to get his feet to feet but they only but uh, but only stumbled and fell heavily bruising the side of his face as he lifted his hand to his face again, he felt something warm clinging to it, something heavy. He tried to shake it away, but by now he had a firm grip. He pulled at the body with his other hand and felt brittle hair. Though his panic, through his panic he understood that what held him in his monstrous grip. It was a rat, but it was a big, very big, could have been mistaken for a small dog. There was no growling, no long legs to kick his body. Only what seemed to be razor edged claws, frankly beating on his lower arm. Tried again his feet. Again as he moved, felt more pain on his leg, he screamed. Blinding pain seemed to run up his leg to his very testicles. More teeth sank into his thigh. As he stood, he felt tiny feet running up the length of his body. He actually felt hot, fugitive breath as he looked down to see what could climb a man's body with such speed. Huge teeth they were, were meant for his throat sank at his cheek and tore away a huge flap. His body poured blood. Now she thrashed around. Once he thought he found the door, as something heavy leapt on his back and pulled him forward on the floor again. Rats, his mind screamed the words. Acts, rats, eating me alive. God, God help me. Flesh was ripped away from the back of his neck. He couldn't rise now, for the sheer weight of withering. Furry vermin feeding on his body, drinking his blood. Shivers ran along his spine to his shocked brain. The dim shadows seemed to be f- to float before him. Then a redness ran across his vision. It's a redness of unbelievable pain. He couldn't see any more. A rat had really eaten his eyes. Then he felt nothing, just a spreading sweetness over his body. He died with no thoughts on his mind. Not even of his beloved, always forgotten Francis. The sweetness, not even pain. He's beyond that. The rat said her feel of his body, but he was still hungry. So he searched, searched for more food, same kind. They had tasted their first human blood.